Hello and welcome to Wednesdays with WV. This is episode number 15. My guest on this episode is one who played a very good hand despite the indifferent cards that uh, cricket dealt him. And of course, after finishing his uh, playing days, he took up to coaching. He has the unique distinction of being the first Indian to be part of uh, a coaching setup of a major cricketing nation. He was one of the coaches for the Australian team. He had a good stint for about six years. And once he finished that assignment, he took charge of the Bangladesh team in the recently concluded World Cup in Australia. Of course, I'm talking about none other than Sridhar and Sriram, who was also a very good left arm spinner during this and then went on to become a high scoring batter for Tamil Nadu. But uh, of late, he's uh, known more for his association with uh, the international sides as a coach. It's my pleasure to present to you Sriram <laughs> Sridharan, who of course is no stranger to all of you. Welcome, Sri, and uh, how are you doing? Excellent. I'll, I'll call you sir because you've seen me from the age of 13. And that's how I called you in the beginning. So I just want to keep it like that. So I, thank you. Thank you for having me. You know me. I'm easy. You can call me WE or whatever you want. <laughs> No, but I think I'll stick to sir because we go back a long way. Good and, boy. Uh, Good boy. <laughs> How was it handling Bangladesh in the World Cup and that too in your familiar territory? The World Cup was in Australia. Yeah, I think it was a good challenge. Uh, it came all of a sudden. So I was like um, thrown into the deep sea, if I can say. so. But I enjoyed it really. It was a lovely challenge. And I think it was a sort of natural progression for me to take up a head coaching role uh, for a national team, uh, that to an evolving team. So it was a very good challenge that I really enjoyed. Australia and Bangladesh, two sides of the spectrum, like chalk and cheese. Must have been difficult for you to adjust. Uh, yes and no, but uh, Australia are definitely very professional. Uh, but Bangladesh, I think, uh, I knowing their culture, I mean, being a... Uh, being from the subcontinent, I sort of related both to the boys as well as to the board. So I think that that was a big uh, sort of upside to my going there. Uh, I really adapted well to their culture and same with the boys. They spoke Hindi. Uh, I was able to communicate. The language barrier was not there. They see a lot of Hindi movies, Bollywood movies, all the boys. So their Hindi is pretty fluent. Um, even though sometimes this go on in Bengali, which I can't understand. But I think majority of the times I got them. There's a limit to how many languages we can learn, Sri. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course, as far as Bangladesh is concerned, uh, they won a couple of games in the World Cup. That must be very encouraging, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we had a young side. It was a deliberate ploy to go in with the young side. Uh, we wanted to build really to the future, build towards the next World Cup. That was really our sort of... Uh, uh, motive even when we picked the team and Bangladesh had never won a game in the Super 12s of the T20 World Cup since 2007 so winning two games I think was a huge positive and we had a chance, we had a chance we came very close to India and if we had won the Pakistan game we would have made it to the semi-finals, it would have been history but again uh, just going with the positives, winning two games in the Super 12s I think should give the side a lot of confidence Shri, you were quite animated in the game against <laughs> India. What is it all about? No, I have to hear that story. <laughs> I mean, <it's, laughs> there's no story behind it. Actually, uh, we were going hammer and tongs. We were, uh, I think, 7 over 66 for no loss. When the rain came, we were way ahead of the uh, Duckworth Lewis where we needed to be. And the boys were talking about winning the game. So I was like, mentally be prepared to play the whole game because you know if the rain stops you got to be ready to play the game and not count on Duckworth Lewis to win the game that was my message to them when the rain came so I was talking to them everybody individually saying that be prepared to play a full game be prepared to chase down 180 so be mentally ready and when the game started we needed 85 in the nine overs that were left and I thought it was the ball was getting wet, it was coming on to the bat. They couldn't bowl spin with the wet ball. So all they had to bowl was medium pace. And we had to use the pace and make use of the square boundaries. And that was what the message was. And there was a bit of panic. And 15-20 minutes of real sort of um, 
I I can't get a I can't get the right word for it, but we committed a bit of hira kiri in the 15 minutes, and I was just not being animated, but I was just telling them that what did we speak about? We just had to stick to what we speak about, and you know that's the part of the learning of the young boys uh, when they face a situation like that. When you know we, we've never played shortened games, so I think that was a big experience for them, a big learning to take away. From the immediate so, past, <laughs> let's go back a lot further back. We'll go okay. back to your younger days. Yes. You were a superstar in the under-19 days, but the transition to the senior level was a bit tough, wasn't it? Yeah, I think um, I lost my way a little bit with my bowling. Uh, then I had to, you know, remodel myself as a batsman, and you know, had to. I was not a naturally gifted batsman by any means. Uh, I was more sort of a gifted bowler, but I had to work to. you know develop my batting skills which meant i had to survive in the game and i think at that time mrf was pretty helpful for me uh, in sort of accommodating me more as a batsman giving me the opportunities to go higher up the order make uh, make me stake my claims as a batsman so i mean those few years were a bit challenging but uh, i think i got through it pretty well and happy with how i ended up with all the knowledge that you have at your disposal now do you think playing too long at the under 19 level harmed you uh, good question i've never thought about it that way actually i made my first class debut at the age of 15 uh, but then i didn't play for the next 3 or 4 years probably that stalled my um, growing up a bit so i mean tamil nadu had some very good spinners at that time Uh, i didn't get the opportunity to play uh, continuous back to back games of first class cricket and then i had to go back to under 19 so that it was not that something i wanted to do but something i had to do because i wasn't getting the opportunities at first class level yeah that mindset is prevailing even today because associations generally tend to make a player play at a lesser level because mm-hmm. they are looking at winning the trophy at that level by that i mean if somebody is good to play for the state mm-hmm. side and if he is 17 years old they mm-hmm. make him go and play the under 19 level i think that stunts the growth a little bit yeah i think once you played india under 19 the quicker you transition playing first class cricket and ipl now with the opportunities being more if somebody can play the ipl or play consistent first class cricket i think is always better uh, i think playing india under 19 is very important Uh, but as soon as you play india under 19 the quicker the transition happens uh, i think the better for the cricketer and that's where the state and all the selectors have to have that vision for the player and you know uh, be well planned in in terms of why where they see him for the next few years and how, what is his sort of uh, development plan how frustrating was it you were trying harder and harder but still the bowling skills never came back to you must have been frustrating yeah. yeah the harder i tried the worse i got actually so it it was a tough phase because i was doing everything i possibly could to get back my action to get back uh, my old rhythm but uh, it's funny uh, i don't have an answer for it even today uh, how i sort of uh, how it sort of deserted me at that time but i think uh, i it was a great learning for me to you know a uh, fail as a spinner but today in my i take a lot of lessons when i coach about more about failure and about what not to do than about you know if somebody has had tremendous success sometimes the learning is not as much as when you fail but you adapted quickly really well because you churned out runs by the tons and then went on to play for the country as the top order bat that's not easy yeah. by any means yeah i as i said i wasn't a very naturally gifted player all i could do was you know um value my wicket as dear to me as possible and just stay in the wicket and um churn out those runs and i think um, that's a quality i imbibed because i lost my bowling and i had to survive in the game uh so that's that's a good quality to have to be having that kind of steely resolve you know fight for each and every run value your wicket uh, i mean to go through the grind in first class cricket uh, seeing the ups and downs at that age of between 19 and 23 24 so i think it was a very challenging period but looking back i think i learned a lot i know what it would have been but for the benefit <laughs> of people watching this uh, you were uh, crippled in a way because you lost bowling 
and then overnight it becomes a one ball game because as a batter mm -hmm. if you make one mistake the game mm -hmm. is gone how mm -hmm. tough was it it was like a catching up game all the time isn't it yeah but somewhere deep down i always believed that i could uh, come back as a bowler and that's what kept me going as well and even when i had bad days with the bat i think i always chipped in with the ball uh, even bowling a few overs here and there a wicket here and there uh, just kept me going in the team and you know kept me going contributing to the team so that again i, uh, I think helped a bit because of the, that belief uh, that i would be able to come back with the ball so that that sort of helped me what was the indian dressing room like when you made your appearance for for the country i think yeah the indian dressing room was as normal as it was i mean i think you have to be very mentally tough to sort of go there and establish yourself you've got to find your own way it's not that you know um, there are too many people helping you out and you've got to sort of uh, be switched on the moment you go in and i think you've got to be lucky to have a good start in international cricket once you have a good start that belief comes in you that you can be your part of that level and you're not chasing the game but whereas if you don't have a very good start to your career i think you're chasing the game a bit and uh, that's when again the challenge is even more john wright was the coach then he brought a new perspective isn't it in terms of how people saw the game by itself and how people communicated a lot of things we were new then yeah at that time i think he was probably one of the first uh, foreign coaches that india have ever had so he definitely brought in a new perspective him simple things like turning up to training on time finishing in that you know two and a half three hours stipulated time just not going beyond that uh, giving the bowlers a bat uh, helping each other out i mean i think he brought in a lot of new things which you know at that time was uh, foreign to us now let's have an honest answer you must have thought about it many a time if only i had more opportunities uh, i mean uh, definitely yes i would be lying if i said no but again what i went through has made me what i am today so i'm very happy what happened because today whatever i am i owe it to where i go back at those times the times i had struggled the times i had to fight uh, the times i had to get up each time out of falling down i think has made me the person today and, and that's helped me tremendously in my coaching and the fact that i don't carry any baggage in my head also helps me with my coaching because i sincerely believe that um, my playing days i have nothing i've left nothing behind and, and you know i've done all that i could and i can if i put my head on the pillow i, I sleep really well so i've left no stone unturned from my side so that makes me even more committed as a coach to the person i'm coaching rather than think about myself what made you take up coaching after you quit cricket uh, i think it was accident <laughs> i i was playing in england at that point of time I was um, i had left tamil nadu i play, i was playing for maharashtra if i remember right i was working for dy patil playing um, uh time shield cricket in mumbai so that's something i wanted to experience you know get out of chennai see different parts of the country play as a professional and then there was a time when i had to get a visa to go to england and because i had uh, i wasn't playing first class cricket when i joined the icl uh, they had to have a coaching qualification for me to go to get a work permit to go to england that's what made my club push me to do the level 2 and once i did the level 2 i was sort of doing uh, grassroots level coaching in england which i was enjoying uh, working with the kids in the afternoon going to every school uh, popularizing the game and then um, i said not a bad idea to do a level 3 and that's when i did my level 3 in england uh, and my club helped me obviously for that i spent a winter in england uh, in december january in the freezing cold in uh, derbyshire and Uh, where was it um, i think it was derbyshire and where their academy is i can't get the right name for it uh, but again i did my Lappara. level 3 sorry was it lafbara yeah lafbara right that was uh, derbyshire and lafbara and then uh, that's that's when the coaching journey started and then i had an opportunity to work in new zealand in auckland uh, 
for a club and a college because I was not allowed to play any cricket in India during the ICL time. So again, going and working in New Zealand again opened up a different avenue for me coaching wise, and that's where I sort of started to realize the coach in me. Since then, you worked with a lot of high-profile coaches. Gary Kirsten, one among them. What impressed you most about Gary Kirsten? Gary was a very good communicator. I mean, his his uh, he was very good in addressing a group. Uh, his one-on-one chats were very good. Uh, he sort of handled the big egos uh, very well at that time in the Indian team. So I think uh, his strength was definitely communication. And you are big break. came around 2016 when you became a part of the Aussie side did you pinch yourself i mean that's another very interesting story actually i was working for delhi daredevils and um, marcus stoinis and travis head were in that squad at that time so they weren't playing any they weren't playing the ipl they were just uh, made to carry the drinks and so they went up to gary and said uh, we're not playing games so uh, if If you don't mind, we can go back home and work on our skills. So Gary said, uh, "Why don't you work in India? It's a great opportunity to come to India, and you don't get this often. So take the help of Sri, take him for training." And we used to do extra sessions. Toynis, Head, and myself. We just used to stay back uh, after training. And then what happened? We one day we were going back, and the took the auto rickshaw that we took broke down. So we were walking on the streets of Delhi, and then we sat for a coffee. and stoinis was like shri i think i've improved my game against spin and you know i'm feeling good about all this and i just very casually said you know what stoin i should do this for australia and he said wow great idea so he wrote an email to greg chapel saying that you know i've been working with shri he's helped me a lot and this is something we can explore and greg chapel was the coach of india at the fag end of my career so who he knew who i was and troy cooley was at the academy at that time troy had a great connection with mrf and dennis lilly so troy obviously knew who i was so i got a meeting with troy uh, in chennai in the mrf face foundation and said troy said come and do a few sessions for us and then the a team the australia a team came to india and i did uh, a few sessions with them they had usman khwaja joe burns callum ferguson peter hanscom uh, stephen o'keefe ashton agar adam zampa so they had all these guys at that time in 2015 and lo and behold uh, australia a won that test match against india a which had virat kohli cheteshwar pujara uh, pragya noja amit mishra and all these guys so that sort of uh, took everybody it, it took the notice of everybody and that's when the big break came i got an email from darren lehman saying that would you be interested in working with the main team so that's how the break happened it was again i was very lucky <laughs> talking of darren lehman he's got a character isn't he but he's highly respected uh, yeah buff buff definitely a character <laughs> <laughs> he yeah he, he's a very chilled kind of guy he, he has a very uh, sort of a casual way about the way he deals with players is uh he's very street smart is tactically he is good uh, so he's a very different style of coaching to say a gary kirsten but yeah buff was a very good character very he had he always saw, saw the sort of lighter side of things and even under pressure he could sort of lighten the whole environment by you know cracking a joke or pulling somebody's leg so he had that knack about him you know which took the pressure off the players so that that was probably his strength and after him comes a character like langa who was very intense but would you say that he had a volatile temperament no i mean for me um, langa is one of the best coaches i ever worked with he was so passionate and that at that point of time when he took over australian cricket in 2018 when they had the sandpaper gate uh, controversy i the the australian public had sort of you know uh, gone away from the australian cricket team so the, he he had a big job to sort of reinstate that uh, faith in the australian cricket team again so i think no better person than justin lang he's a true and out and out aussie passionate uh, very very sort of patriotic um, 
for him the country came first the baggy green he was so proud about the possession of the baggy green so again i think playing the values and the culture he brought into the team you know the mateship the sort of humility uh, these values that he brought into the australian team i think i sort of really respect what he did and at that point of time he was the best person for that job but after boff langer's intensity would have looked far too pronounced isn't it again at that time uh, with steve smith david warner going out it was sort of a very young group and i think they needed that sort of person uh, for them who could sort of be the elder brother show them the right path and you know tap them on the shoulder if they weren't doing the right thing so i think he was a perfect sort of coach at that point of time yes he was asking them challenging questions but i think at that time it was very essential the job of a head coach of australian cricket team is a coveted job no doubt but it also seems to be a very stressful job isn't it both had a heart issue then langer went out in bad taste what happens towards the end of their tenure i think uh, yeah any head coaching job in england india australia it's a high profile job and uh, it comes with its own challenges i think uh, and all three formats take a toll honestly sir i think in modern day cricket um, coaching 12 months of the year day in day out um, with that stress and pressure that comes with the expectations of with the job and i know uh i think transitioning between formats uh, if you building a very good test side probably your one day or your y t20 sort side sort of suffers a little bit again you've got to rest the players at the right time there's never a right time in international cricket every series has its own importance and so i think it comes with a lot of stress and i think that's what gets to them I, there is a shelf life for every coach at that level and i think it's somewhere between 4 to 5 years and i think both buff and uh, justin langer did very well to you know do that 4 5 years tenure talking of shelf life of a coach you got out at the right time didn't you you had enough number of years so yeah, i had put in 6 7 years and on the road and with the covid um, so i had to stay in australia for 7 months at a time uh, i didn't see enough of my family so it was a decision that i had been pondering for a while even after winning that t20 world cup um, uh, i was it was definitely on my mind well, what's the right time to quit but once justin langer went um, i had a chat with him and I, i i also felt at that time that it was the right time to sort of come out and i think i'd made the correct decision during the tug of war that is happening between langer and the rest were you seen as langer's man uh I think Langer had great trust in me. There was no doubt about it. He he really trusted me in a lot of things. And but when it all happened uh, in the Ashes in two thousand twenty-one, I wasn't there for that whole series. I only did a very uh, after the World Cup with COVID. I couldn't travel, so I didn't sort of do that whole Ashes series. So that's when the whole thing happened. So again, uh, probably I wasn't seen as Langer's man at that point of time. Ricky Ponting tried his best to rope uh, Langer into some coaching gig. And now we are talking about uh, different styles of coaching and coaches. What do you make of Ricky Ponting? You worked with him also. Yeah, uh, he was a very players coach. He's all he was almost a captain like he he coached the team like he was a captain. He was he was there for everybody. He's almost like uh, he was with the players most of the time. He used to go out in the evening with them. He used to sit with them for a meal. He would throw balls. I had no end. He used to talk technique. He loved uh, talking cricket. So I think uh, he he sort of he's one of the boys, and that sort sort of gets them going as well. And a person of Ricky Ponting stature, and if he's so open and mingling with you, I think that gets the boys going. And that that was Ricky's strength. I think even as a captain, that's what they say. he was always there in the nets throwing balls to the younger guys helping out uh, the younger boys with their game uh, he was he was almost a coach when he was captain and when he was a coach he's almost a captain so he he had a good blend you know as one of the guys who are plotting and planning from the other dressing rooms what according to you are the shortcomings of team india 
Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> why do you win in the World Cup or uh, yeah, generally? Let's do the... formats. Let's talk about the white ball format rather. I think white ball format. Um, India is always a top heavy side. Uh, they rely a lot on their top four and five, uh, which again you've got to break through early against India. If you get that two three early wickets, you always felt you're in with in with a chance. Uh, that was one thing we always felt plotting against india um what else in the white ball format i think india is one of the best sides now in the white ball because of, of players like the young players like surya kumar yadav rishabh pant i mean the power that they possess they probably did not have that a little while ago but i think with the power of hardik surya uh rishab i think it makes them even more of formidable side what do you think uh, is the reason for india faltering in the icc championships uh, again i think it's the uh, dependence on the uh, on the top 3 and one in a big game if your top 4 don't have the best of days i the, the that's what happened in 2019 in the two, uh, the world cup even in 2021 in the t20 world cup the top order in certain games didn't stand up and even against england in the big semi final even though virat got the runs uh, uh, the top order didn't have the best of days so i think that probably you just have that bad day when your top order doesn't click and that's when india falters talking of india the way they made a comeback in the 2021 series Australia must have been taken aback. They wouldn't have expected that, did they? Yeah, I think India played so well in that series. I mean, uh, for players like uh, Washington Sundar, Nataraj, and Siraj, Shardul Thakur to step up in Brisbane and the way Rishabh Pant and Ashwin and Vihari saved the game in Sydney, I think it was a phenomenal achievement. Again, shows uh, the sort of bench strength that India had built up uh, in that whole series. and that's what i think after getting bowled out for 36 in adelaide uh, coming back to win in melbourne drawing in sydney and going to brisbane with a chance of you know either winning drawing or losing the series uh, was a phenomenal effort and the way the last test panned out in brisbane was probably one of the best days of cricket um, to witness because chasing 329 i think it was and 300 more than 300 on the last day the which pujara fought out the first session shubman gills counter attacking 91 and the way rishabh pant washington shardul uh, played and shardul's five wicket i think siraj got five wickets uh, shardul spell with the new ball and it just goes to show the bench strength that india had built up there was one theory floating that time that was australia playing the same bowlers was not the right thing because they got tired towards the end of the series any merit in it Uh, it was discussed whether you needed to change the bowlers uh, but i think it was the call that the bowlers themselves took they wanted to play pat cummins uh, hazelwood and stark i think at that level if you've got such experienced bowlers you leave it to them they they know their bodies uh, much more than what the coaches do or the physiotherapists or the you know the medical team i think the the uh, in such a high profile series any champion bowler would want to be a part of it and i think they put their hand up to play each and every test um, um i am the, the fierce competitors that they all three are you know come in hazelwood and stark they're very fierce competitors and they never buckle out of a challenge so i think they put their hand up to play australia has the big bash like india has the ipl but yet the record is very modest in terms of world cup titles in the t20 format why do you think I think T20 is a very constantly evolving game, and um, the grounds in Australia are so big that you've got to play a different kind of game in Australia, where it's about boundaries, running hard between wickets, twos. But whereas when you come to the subcontinent in England, it's more about the boundary percentage and the sixes. So I think that's where Australia are a little bit caught. Uh, they cannot play that brand of cricket in australia with the wickets being a little bit spicy offering that extra bounce huge square dimensions or huge long boundaries so i 
the the brand of T20, and that's that's what happened even in the World Cup. This lot of sides couldn't play the same brand. Even England, for that matter, couldn't play that same brand of attacking cricket which they play back home. So I think that's where the game is at the moment with the bigger boundaries, the spicier wickets in Australia compared to everywhere in the else in the world where the dimensions are smaller and the boundary percentages are much more uh, uh, sort of in the picture. You know, I think in an average, the boundary percentage is 15 or 16 percent outside in the world, whereas in Australia is 11 percent. So there is a big difference in the boundary percentage. And that's where teams have to adopt when you go to Australia. And the same for Australia when they come outside. And the question that begs now, after your explanation, why didn't Australia go all the way in this uh, recent World Cup? Again, it was the, the bad day that they had against New Zealand. Uh, getting uh, bowled out for 100, uh, chasing 200 in that game in Sydney, I think that hurt the net run rate so badly. And again, that was a st the strategy. They wanted to go all power. Uh, they decided not to play Steve Smith. But again, in this World Cup, uh, the value of somebody playing right through the innings was showing because Devon Conway did that for New Zealand. Um, Babar Azam or Rizwan did that for Pakistan. Virat did that for India. And even somebody like uh, David Malan did that for England. So this World Cup was again not about all-out attack, but somebody in the top four had to bat long. And the wickets were such, the dimensions of the ground were such. Probably Australia wanted to go the England way and that didn't suit them in this World Cup. You've been around as a coach for a while now, approaching a decade almost. What's your coaching philosophy and how do you describe your style of coaching? I think um, what I've learned is to be as adaptable as I can and there's no one size fits all. Uh, you've got to get the pulse of the group, you've got to get the pulse of the player. Uh, Again, building the relationship with the player is so important and leaving all your baggage behind uh, as a player, as yourself, just go there with the mentality to, you know, sort of genuinely help. Be as best prepared as possible, best planned as possible, do your homework and, you know, uh, that's been my coaching philosophy. Be as adaptable as you can, just be able to, you know, be flexible on the go and be as prepared as you can. Two countries down, a coaching role with Team India must be in your vision. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would love to if the opportunity presents itself. Uh, I never say never. So, yeah. And it's a great honor to coach India. It's not, it's not um, uh, something that you can do. Anyone can do every day. It's, it's a great honor to be, you know, either representing your country or coaching your country. And and those opportunities don't come up for everyone. So if someone gets the opportunity, I think they're truly blessed. I'm sure somewhere down the line, I will see this happening, Sri. All the very best. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> Take care. That was Sri Ram Sridharan now uh, giving his insights about all things related to cricket, Australia, World Cup, white ball cricket, red ball cricket, about Team India. And it's always a delight to have a chat with him. He's upfront and he's also very good in his uh, analysis. And uh, as far as uh, you viewers are concerned, you can always catch up the earlier episodes on the handles of Hindu on the Sports Star for those who are joining us for the first time. I'd like to request you to press the like button and also subscribe and most importantly, leave your comments because we'd like to know what it is that you like about our shows and what it is that you'd like to see in the future. So until I meet you next week, take care and be good.